Hey everybody, Dr. Wenzel Brentwood, MD. Welcome to video three in a three-part series all about executive level physicals. Um, if you've missed the first two trainings, please go back and watch those. I think you'll find them useful. In this video, this is gonna be all about strategies for health optimization, the nuts and the bolts, the tactical level stuff that I give my private level clients um, and really are able to uh, have the unique pleasure and good fortune of sitting front row with some of these unbelievably successful uh, and amazing human beings as they get tremendous breakthrough in their health and vitality. Uh, and I'm gonna share some of those insights with you in a very simple five-part framework that I walk all of my clients through. Number one, if you've learned anything from what I teach, my hope is that you understand that you have got to stop smoking. Because if you smoke, we can do everything else right, but we're gonna put ourselves at unbelievable risk for essentially 90% of diseases. Smoking is just, it, it's a non-starter. We've got, we've got to eliminate that from uh, our behavior list if we have ambition to be healthy and to live a long time. Uh, I understand it's a hard thing to walk away from, but um, it's just, it, it's a, it has to be a must. It is the number one cause of preventable death on the planet. Moving to number two, you've got to stop smoking. All efforts need to be going to, into stopping smoking. Uh, once you have that, we can move to number two. Number two is really a multiple level step where we need to optimize blood sugar and lipids, lipids we've defined in previous trainings as cholesterol and triglycerides, decrease visceral fat and increase lean mass. I put all these together because of the intimacy with which they are all connected. You can't really achieve one without the other and this is kind of majoring in major things. By optimizing your blood sugar, which I believe is the holy grail, you will in turn put downward pressure to improve all of these other things. And I, I find of all of the areas that you could focus on, this is going to be the most impactful outside of stopping smoking. And the way to do that most effectively, based on what I have found, is through diet. You cannot outrun your mouth. No amount of exercise will undo a bad diet. You've got to get the diet down pat. For me, one of the most interesting, fascinating, and obsessive topics I have in all of health right now is in intermittent fasting. I am a huge fan. I've created a lot of content around fasting. I'd encourage you to uh, dig into some of that where we break down fasting, the benefits, where to start. Intermittent fasting, and then when you do open your mouth to eat, generally living in a low carbohydrate uh, or a moderately restrictive carbohydrate environment. That singularly is the best dietary strategy to achieve the goal of number two. When you layer that into a hormonal optimization program where we are primarily looking at testosterone, insulin sensitivity, and overall thyroid optimization, especially for my female patients, this is critical, 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 critical that your neurohormonal environment is tuned up as well. Strength training, listen, human beings are powerful creatures. We're designed to be in motion and move powerfully, explosive burst type movements. If you don't have a very intentional strength training regimen, um, we're really missing an opportunity, especially if you've got the diet right and you've got your hormones optimized. If you're not layering into that a strength training regimen, probably three, no more than four days a week of strength training. You can do other forms of training, but three to four, if you're doing it right, that's about all you can handle without having really a compromised recovery um, type situation. And then sleep. Listen, sleep, there's a lot of debate about sleep. Most humans walking the earth need somewhere between seven, eight, or nine hours of sleep a night. There are some unicorns that only need five or six and some sleepy heads that need nine or 10. But most people that fall under that bell curve need seven to nine sleep, seven hours, uh, seven to nine hours of sleep a night. It is vastly underrated. Do not 
think that it makes you smart or strong to not sleep. It's actually, the data are very clear on this. You've got to get reliable, consistent, high quality sleep. Step number three, again, one of my hot topics is audit your alcohol intake. If you have any ambition to lose fat off your body and you're consuming more than two to three drinks a week, you're probably running you're definitely running a higher risk of sabotaging your efforts than you are giving it credit. Alcohol has a tremendous impact at the level of the liver. I've created more content around that. If you don't have a need to lose fat, you could probably tolerate uh, more alcohol intake. But this is an underrated, underappreciated, overlooked um, aspect of an overall health strategy. I generally say two to three drinks a week if you're actively pursuing fat loss. If you're not actively pursuing fat loss and you're more of a maintenance and you've got the diet right and your hormones are right and your strength training and your sleeping, you could probably have one to two drinks a day and probably not have a net gain. But this is a real slippery slope and everybody's a little bit different and one or two turns into four or five very quickly. Um, so be very careful with alcohol. Number four, stress management. I've touched on this before. The highest achievers that I have ever met uh, are not interested in eliminating stress. They have a very clear understanding that stress is part of the human condition and that our goal should not be to scale the mountain of no stress because number one, that's a fantasy mountain, that mountain doesn't exist, but that we should be, we should be scaling the mountain of better stress management. Are we having higher quality things be the, the source of our stressors? Um, are we learning to delegate? Are we learning to um, give our uh, events that happen in our life different meanings? Or can we assign some different emotional um, backing to some of our experiences? Which leads into the, 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 the highest, most impactful areas that I see affect people's stress level are relationships. And I'm talking about your most important earthly relationships. I'm talking about your spouse. I'm talking about your children. I'm talking about that inner core circle of five to seven people. The quality of those relationships typically are a great indicator of the quality of your overall stress and the quality of your life. Don't underestimate the value of investing in these core five to seven relationships. Improve those. You will improve the quality of your life. And a lot of people need to cut two to three people out of that inner core because they don't deserve a seat there. Uh, Work-life balance. I think for some people this is a kind of a mystical fantasy um, image. Um, I, I think in part because it's thought about incorrectly, you know, because when we think about balance, we think about that's work-life balance. We're just kind of like even even, even. But that's not the way life works. That's not the way nature works. That's not the way seasons work. We, we tend to have, most of the time, disharmony, uh, one side or the other. The name of the game in work-life balance, though, is that you aren't disproportionately always in one season. So you've got to build, but building creates chaos and a mess. Are you taking enough time to clean up the mess? Exerting yourself creates a debt that needs to be repaid, whether it's financial or physiologic or emotional or physical that needs to be repaid. Is there a give and a take? Is there a summer for every winter? Is there a spring for a fall? I think that's the balance that people are looking for, but it tends to be a real contributor to stress when we're constantly in one season or another, and we don't have the counterbalance to even it out. But this idea that we just kind of live a balanced life, I don't know, I mean, maybe some monks do, but like normal, everyday, common people do not achieve this. Uh, boundaries, boundaries is another big contributor to stress management. Um, you know, uh, I would say that the primary contributor to not having boundaries is the inability for people to be very good at saying no. Uh, I find as people move through life, the better they have to become at saying no, no, no thank you, no thank you. That you have to become very, very protective of your asset of time and resources and relationship. And that 
things need to be ultimately an absolute unequivocal no doubt about it yes or they need to be a no and as you move through life it becomes more and more important to be better at saying no lastly number five joy i believe one of the most underrated emotional experiences in humanity is joy and i don't mean joy by crushing another deal or starting another business or taking a big exit i'm talking about joy because those are joyous but joy that comes outside of the marketplace something that you do out of the arena does that make sense something that brings you joy whether it's contributing to your church or mentoring young men and women or buying a 67 chevy and fixing it up because you've always wanted to or writing music or or um, painting or traveling or trying new things don't underestimate the power of joy being infused into your life outside of the marketplace find ways to divert things that are not essential and diverting those time, money, resources into things that bring you joy, make you come alive. This is one of the magic, magic formulas to a long and happy and vibrant life. Listen, I really hope this video and this whole series has been valuable for you. Um, I'd love to hear your comments. Let me know what you think. And um, listen, until we meet again, take care.